Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of ElevateNonprofit.com, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swaim. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. I'm so glad you're here with us today. And Sam, I'm so glad to have who we have today. I know. One of our favorite humans. One of our favorite humans, Lisa Watson. So um, I want to frame today's discussion a little bit because, Lisa, you come with so many skills, vantage points, roles, expertise, phenomenal insight. And we really want to hone in and focus on boards of directors. <laughs> but I want to frame this discussion in a specific way because I think often when we talk about boards of directors, we're talking about them, about what they're doing, about what they're not doing, what they're asking us to do, all of that sort of thing. So I want to kind of flip this script a little bit today and talk to you as a board member and sort of get your vantage point and some of your experience and your expertise so that we can figure out in this nonprofit structure how all these pieces can more symbiotically fit together. Does that sound like a... That sounds great. A sounds great like way a to blast. spend your time, right? A blast. <laughs> blast. Hey, Sam, could you introduce Lisa to I us, I can. Please? Let me do the formal bio Love introduction. <laughs> Lisa Watson, besides being one of our favorite humans, is a seasoned leader with her two decades of experience in operations, strategy, and team management, her passion for social justice and commitment to cultivating inclusive organizational structure, uh, cultures drives her work. She has been a small business owner, a nonprofit fundraiser, a really good one, an executive director, as well as a dedicated volunteer and public servant. In addition, Lisa has been a transformational board member at many different nonprofits. I want to really emphasize many because your your <laughs> board service is impressive. It is. Uh, she brings clarity, focus, and intentionality to all that she does. She, we have known her and loved her for a very long time and are thrilled to have her join us um, February 1st and 2nd. She's going to be our MC at Elevate, yes. so we're so, so, excited. so excited. We hope everyone will join us, but Lisa, we're so honored to have you here joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much. Let's just kick this door wide open. Great. I'm going to ask you <laughs> right from the top. What are board members actually saying yes to when they sign up for the role <laughs> of a nonprofit board of directors? What a great start. Um, I think that the answer for that depends on the organization, obviously, because every board of directors has a its own personality, let's say, <laughs> its own culture. Um, but I think the commonality is to show up for the organization. I think that that can look a lot of different ways, whether it's the way you show up to support the executive director, um, provide direction for the staff and the rest of the board. But one of the things, and I'll probably repeat this a few times today, is just talking about knowing your capacity and mm. what you have to give, yeah. whether that's time, talent, expertise, sometimes money, yeah. mm, fundraiser. So I have to talk about that too. But I think when you're saying yes, you're saying yes to giving up a part of your life for an organization. And one of the things that I have taken on is sort of a personal um, challenge to myself is to say no more often than I used to <laughs> to things like board service and committees because more than once in my life I found myself a little over stretched, a little over or under capacitated. So I think one of the most important things is to just know what you're getting into. One of the really common things I heard when I first started board services, people would say, oh, it's just one meeting a month for oh. two hours, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Nothing else. We're all laughing at that. Um, because the reality is if you want to be an effective board member, it is going to be a lot more than that. If you don't care about your effectiveness as a board member, you might be able to get away with that, but it, right. it's not going to serve the organization. So I think just being really real and having that honest conversation with the staff, with other board members, especially like for me, that's one of the first things I always do is meet with other board members to hear the real story and yeah, what, right. <laughs> what the true commitment is going to be. And also to talk about the needs of the organization and see if there's some things that you can lend in your experience and expertise. How many boards are you currently on? I'm on three. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's just, my limit. I'm looking to understand perspective when yeah. you say you're starting to say no. I'm like, but that still is a full plate for yes, you. Yes, very much. Yeah. And and one is a very light, literally is a really light lift, but others are a lot bigger. So yeah. it, I, I knew that going in when I made the choice. So yeah. 
I also think there's something interesting in what you said about the recruitment method of one meeting a month. <laughs> right. So <laughs> from the Talk jump. Talk about setting the, sta- like the well, standard low. <laughs> so from the jump, they're telling how you, that you how they value, see, right. integrate their board. But they're also really, really undercutting the potential of that role and that expertise and what that could bring to the table. And that probably colors everything from there on out. Yeah. Because if you go into it thinking, oh, this isn't much to do and you get there and not only is there more to do than you realize, but if they're not even asking you to lend that expertise, you don't feel like you're of value at all. And that's so demotivating. I've I've been in that situation. You're just like, why am I bothering to even spend these two hours a month? Because there's no real opportunity for me to have impact. So... Yeah, I think setting it up honestly from the beginning is really key. Well, and the idea that you're saying yes because you want an opportunity for impact. I think that often gets lost in this conversation between staff and board and what that is and what that potential tension point can be. And it's like everybody has that want, right? Mm -hmm. We're all ideally on board with the mission and making that impact, and I want to use my skill sets to move that vehicle forward. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that... If you're not setting it up that way, you're not serving your board, but you're also not serving the organization. Right. I think that, uh, you know, the transparency part I mentioned, I think, is is really critical. It's not just what the time commitment is, but it's being really clear about what your contributions can be that are unique to you. What are you bringing that may not already exist in this group of people who are serving the organization? So I think where I have felt the most impactful and valued has been when somebody says to me, and this has happened a couple times, what we really need is your experience from your private business side, yeah, right? Yeah. Your your experience running an, a profitable business is what we need. We need you to look at our financials in a different way than the way we have been. And that's like, that charges me up. I'm like, sure, I'd love to do that, you know? So it's personal that way. Yeah. You, you sort of opened up My next question for you, which is, um, let's talk fiduciary responsibility for a second. I mean, we could such an exciting topic. (laughs) We could talk about this forever. Yeah, I think uh, the concept of board and um, fiduciary responsibility is novel in some places, which I would encourage them to make it not novel. Um, But I'm wondering, from your vantage point as a board member, can you talk to me a little bit about what fiduciary responsibilities? you specifically are sort of taking on and thinking about when you say yes to a board. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, talking about the financial sort of review and observation and guidance that you can give, um, that's just one part of it. I think um, really keeping the interests of the organization at the center of your work, um, being honest about any conflicts of interest that might come up and, you know, recusing yourself from those situations. And just always being mindful of the fact that you have a responsibility to represent the organization well, positively, but to hold it accountable at mm-hmm. the same time, mm-hmm. right? That's honestly the hardest part of board yeah. uh-huh. service yeah. is holding the leadership, the staff, the organization, and your fellow board members accountable when you do see something that's of concern, whether it's a you know an act or something you observe in financials or anything – Your responsibility as a board member, and this is a legal responsibility as a board member, which (laughs) a lot of people don't know, um, is to say something. And if you don't, you now are liable and have risk. So um, in preparation for this, I was kind of looking for some real examples. And there is one where a board of directors was required to pay back payroll taxes Mm. because the organization didn't have the funds to do it. And so... These, this board of directors had to come up with the money. That's, yeah. I mean, it's that serious. Yeah. So it's very rare, thankfully. I've never been in a situation even close to that, thankfully. But that's a real responsibility you're taking on. Um, and just any time you are in any way representing the organization, doing that with the organization's best interest in mind. See, it's more than one meeting a month. Uh-huh. <laughs> it is. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so that leads me down sort of two different paths. One is that when you're talking to organizations about sort of their financials before you join a board, um, do you ever look into any protections, liability, insurance that they have for board members? Because I know that's sort of a, an element that boards can have. Is that something that you've considered before joining a board? 
Yeah. I've never been on a board that doesn't have directors and officers insurance. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I Good. won't. Uh, it is, it's critical because you are taking on a, res- a huge responsibility as a board member. And if that protection isn't there, then I, that, that's a red flag for me. Yeah. So no, I won't serve anywhere where that doesn't exist. So then I also go down the path of the actual fundraising element of the sort of fiscal health of the organization. And I had a well-known philanthropist tell me once as we were having lunch and she sort of paused and looked up and said to me, you either get it, you give it, or you get off the board. And so when you're thinking about the fundraising element of it, how much does their give-get policy or their fundraising needs impact your decision about joining a board? I, that's really evolved for me over the years. I um, I lied earlier when I said three boards because I'm actually helping start a nonprofit right now. <laughs> um, so four. You heard um, it here first. <laughs> but. <laughs> but in this one, one of the things we're talking about is not having a give-get policy mm-hmm. because I think that that's a giant equity issue that is not mm-hmm. addressed enough. Um, I am not a person who has large capacity to give, and I've served on board. I'm serving on boards now where people have – major capacity to give. And I see my role then is to give in different ways. Of course, I'm going to give money that I can give, but I think that my contributions there will probably not be valued in the same way as the people who are monetary givers. Mm -hmm. So I think I have a lot of mixed feelings about give, get policies, but I helped write one at a nonprofit that I was, we were really proud of where the, the policy was, I think it was $1,500 give or get, and if you couldn't uh, commit to that, you had a conversation with the executive director that was, well, what can you do as in service to the organization that is of a comparable value yeah. to the nonprofit? And we ended up attracting some amazing oh. people to the board because they had been afraid of our give-get policy. Yeah. And when we reached out to them and said, hey, we're getting rid of that, we have this other opportunity, they were like, I'm in. Okay. So it just gave us a totally different representation, totally different perspectives on the board. So I think f- having flexibility around that is is really important now, especially now, because boards aren't just fundraising. They're serving the organization in a lot of different ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I want to make sure to continue talking about leadership and fundraising and all things board, but um, we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Elevate. We believe in bringing people together. Our online learning platform for fundraising events has webinars, workshops, downloadable tools, and more designed to save you time and stress when planning your next event. We're getting nonprofit, development, and event planning professionals the tools and ideas they need to create events that inspire donors and raise more money. So join us at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. Welcome back. We are here with Lisa Watson, one of our favorite humans, but who comes to the table as a fundraiser, a nonprofit leader, all of these things. But we're talking to her today in her capacity as an amazing board member. Um, I don't think we talk to board members enough. I think we talk about them a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, we make a lot of assumptions about what they should and shouldn't be doing and what makes them happy and unhappy. And um, we're here to dispel some myths and offer some opportunities to come together across the sector. So um, often boards and staff are pitted against one another. It's actually kind of baked into the colonial DNA of the nonprofit structure, (laughs) if we may be so bold. Yes. Um, So could you talk a little bit about some experience for you of what a functional relationship has looked like there and and sort of how that works. Yeah, I love talking about this because I've seen it work really well. Um, I would say it really starts with the partnership between the executive director and the board chair. Um, mm. uh, I love the analogy of them being co-pilots of the organization, yeah. right? Uh-huh. That's, that's a so Joan good. Gary. I yeah. love Joan Gary. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's a really – the, the most critical piece to start with is having a really healthy relationship and an honest and transparent relationship between the board chair and the executive director. Um, I think when I've seen it work really well, when staff is involved, is when there's open and honest conversations about when it's appropriate for a board member to meet with a staff member. It's appropriate. There's yeah. times when... Yeah. The, the executive director needs to get out of the way and let the fundraiser and the and the fundraising chair 
do their fundraising, right? Yeah. And sometimes the director, it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. Or sometimes they just need to free up their time. It's not worth it for them to be in every meeting. I've worked in organizations and I've been on boards where staff and board conversations literally weren't allowed. It's like a firewall. Yeah. 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 Everything had to funnel through the director. And I don't think that's healthy, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, I think the director should never be surprised. They should know when that's happening, right. right? The staff and the board member should make sure that the director knows. But oftentimes there's work that should just be done between a board member and a staff member. I will also say, because of my personal experience working as a staff member, I am very often tapped by board members to speak into the board space Uh on their behalf, which I'm (laughs) really happy to do. (laughs) Um, I will always advocate for staff perspectives. And so uh, it's really, it's really nice when I can build those relationships with staff members, they can be really honest with me Mm -hmm. about the challenges they're facing and what they need from the board or what they just need the board to talk about. I'm, my husband says to me, says about me that my superpower is making people uncomfortable. <laughs> so I love to come into a space and say, this is the thing that we're not talking about. Let's talk about it. And yeah. it's hard to do that. It's risky. It's risky as a woman of color to do that. Yeah. But I also am like, somebody has to do this. And and that, and that I love doing it because the best results come out of those hard conversations. And so I'll often advocate or listen to the staff directly. Um, I will include the board the, or the executive director and the board chair often if I'm not the board chair and make sure that ideas are sort of socialized among those people first before we bring it to the whole group. But I think that um, – Direct conversations between staff and board can be really, really healthy. Yeah. I think the key is keeping yeah. the rest of the leadership involved in what the conversations are about. Gatekeeping is a funny thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all about power. Yeah. You know, and, and I think um, sometimes naming that sh- can shift the dynamic because I think sometimes people inherit that as a mode of being in the structure right. and don't know that that's what's happening. Yeah. But yeah. I also think some people set it up that way to continue that happening. Yeah. Um, and I think it's super important for us to reach across spaces and really elevate the frontline staff, yeah. the development staff, what's happening. Can you talk a little bit about um, what partnerships with staff as a board member mm-hmm. um, to move maybe something past a sticking point has looked like and, yeah. and, and what's been successful for you there? Yeah, I think um, I will say I was on a board once where the staff was really struggling with the capacity of the board. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people not showing up for things. A lot of people coming to virtual board meetings with their screens off and we couldn't really tell if they were engaged or not. And it was like the whole board was mm-hmm. like that, right? <laughs> like the chair was on screen, the staff was on screen, the rest of the board wasn't. So, but even then they wouldn't show up for events. They wouldn't, they just oh, were disengaged. Yeah. And I think it felt so big and nobody knew the why that people were just afraid to talk about it. And hmm. so we, I talked with the director and I talked with the development person because they were the one who was really struggling because it's like I can't get anybody to work with me on fundraising and talking with their, you know, with their networks of people. And so I talked to the director, talked to the development director, talked to the board chair, and we put it on an agenda. We just talked about engagement. And it was hard. It was because people didn't know. They literally were like, oh my gosh, is that, am I not meeting an expectation? They didn't even realize, most of them, I would say, didn't even realize that they weren't. So we made it really clear what an engaged board member looked like. Mm -hmm. And it was almost immediate because there was just a lack of awareness. So people were afraid to talk about it for so long. Then when we finally did, it was like, oh, phew. It's so much better. <laughs> so yeah. it's like just put it out there and talk about it. Yeah. I think I, I appreciate – I have been in committees with you, <laughs> in leadership roles with you, and I've always appreciated your willingness to – although Peter might frame this as making people uncomfortable <laughs> – but to enter the difficult conversations yeah. with just a direct – no one's to blame. This isn't finger-pointing. This is managing expectations and creating a set of shared agreements. Um, and I think that that has shown up for you in your nonprofit work as a staff member and as a board member and has changed cultures. I've watched cultures shift at organizations that you've been at because of that willingness to just be in conversation, to listen, 
and then to bring those difficult conversations to the table. So thank you for being um, the person that makes people feel uncomfortable, which I don't think you are. I disagree with Peter entirely, <laughs> but um, bringing the hard conversations yeah. to the table. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah. I think one of the things that when we were speaking earlier about um, making decisions about joining boards that I didn't talk about is culture. Yeah. And I think that when I, I looked at Kristen and said, I always talk to other board members, uh-huh. right? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. It's such an important part. And and I what I will say about that is if I get a sense that the culture isn't super healthy, that doesn't mean I'm not going to join that board. Sometimes that means I need to join that board. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Bring right? it. Bring it. Right? Because I'm going <laughs> to say, what the heck are you guys doing here? You know, but other times I'll say to myself, that's too harmful of a space for me and I'm not going to engage with it. So I, I just, I think it's really important. I'm going to say it again, particularly for people of color and for women, if you're yeah. walking into a male dominated space or queer folks walking into a straight space, yeah. knowing what you're walking into and taking care of yourself and deciding really intentionally if you're up for that is so important because what that can do to you and the ways it can harm you are like, that can last for a really long time. <laughs> so it's just really important to say that to assessing the culture is one of the most important things you can do when you're considering joining a board. You're going to spend a lot of time with these people. Yeah. So yeah. it's important. Well, yeah. so that I have so many, like that <laughs> opens so many little nuggets for me because I think that um, or we've witnessed this evolution in the nonprofit sector recently uh, that I think also the for-profit sector is experiencing, but we're seeing the impact in the nonprofit sector differently in that the need has grown. Um, organizations through the past couple of years and the pandemic didn't survive the pandemic. And so those who did are sort of taking on more responsibilities Consumer priorities have changed. So a lot of organizations like arts organizations have really struggled to continue to survive in this environment. And the board role has really shifted into also needing to not just keep the train on the tracks, keep the mission focus, keep the fundraising focus, keep the like financial responsibility, fiducial responsibility, but also crisis management. So you speak to the importance of understanding culture before joining a board, but also I'm curious about sort of what advice you would have for a board member or an organization that's going through leadership change, staff change, mission re- restructure, strategic planning. <laughs> the strategic planning process, I laugh because I think it's so necessary and sometimes is so heavy and mired. So how do you step into those spaces knowing that like what I signed up for might be different? In a year. Yeah. I have had that happen so many times because yeah. even, even before the pandemic, it happened a lot during the pandemic, but even before, because the one constant in nonprofits is change. Like there's constant pressure to adapt to whatever is changing in the environment. Right. So um, I think I, I'll say kind of two, I'll answer that two ways. One is I think the most important thing you can do is stay engaged because it will get harder if you don't. Right. Like you yeah. need to know what's going on. You need to stay informed. And that and by that I also mean stay informed on what's happening in that sector, right? The arts right now in Portland is it's kind of terrifying. Like yeah. the, you know, they lost state funding. There's attendance issues. There's all kind there's downtown issues, right? So there's like a lot of factors contributing to that. And knowing all those factors is a one is one way you can be a good board member, yeah, being yeah. aware of yeah. what the challenges are that the organization is facing. So staying engaged, staying knowledgeable, don't, you know, say you're busy when the strategic planning session is coming up. Like those are really, <laughs> really important milestones for the organization. Yeah. I'll also say sometimes it's time to go. Yeah. I think we feel I, I have resigned from boards twice before my term was up. And it was one of the most like grueling decisions because you're like, I'm failing the organization. I'm failing as a person. I can't do it. But there's times when your capacity is just like, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that could yeah. be your time capacity, but also could be your just your heart is just taking a beating, and you're like, "This isn't good for me. It's time for me to get away." And and I and that's not just okay. I would encourage it <laughs> like uh-huh. just, when it's when it's not working for you, because your board service should also serve you. We should all be learning and growing and getting new skills and and building new relationships. And if it's not doing that, and it's hurting you, it's it's okay to go. Yeah, yeah. And people are afraid to do that, but I yeah. think we need to be more. Uh, aware of how 
things are impacting us instead of only thinking about the organization and the staff and the rest of the board. Like we well, and ultimately, if, if it's impacting you, it's impacting what you're able to do for Absolutely. the organization. Absolutely. You're not going to serve it well. Right. Yeah. Totally agree. Thanks. I so appreciate you uh, making it a dynamic space because I think often um, historically board leadership has been notoriety, check boxes. I have to, this is required of me at this level at my corporation that I serve on a board. Like, right, it's 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 yeah. baked into the system. And so the most revolutionary act is to make it a 3D space mm -hmm. with human beings yeah. happening yeah. in relationship to one another. Um, and I think that unlocks a whole different level mm -hmm. of potential. Yeah, and I think I've always seen it that way because it's never been something that was required of me. It was like I, the first board I was asked to be on, I was like, why? Like, what, do you, <laughs> what, what does this mean, right? But as I have served more and figured out that it's a it's a relationship. It's not it's not me serving something or me getting something. It's it's everybody that's involved has to benefit in some way and support each other in some way. So I've ne thankfully I've never had that sort of compulsory service, but yeah. I've definitely served with a lot of people who have, <laughs> and it often looks really different, really different. Now you've been in a position as an employee of a nonprofit and also served on boards. I think that that is something that we keep talking about boards as if they're separate from staff, but I think that that's something that's a really powerful learning opportunity for a staff member to go serve on another board, mm -hmm. especially if they're, if it's an, a learning growing opportunity that doesn't conflict with, you know, sort of right. being asked to do your job in a different, you know, for a different organization. But um, I've just always appreciated that you've been in both spaces. And I think it's what makes you a really strong board member mm, is that you understand the staff need. And as a staff member, you understood the board role too. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's hard because I've also done that at times when I've been a fundraiser right. and served on a board. And I had to have an honest conversation with the board chair and the director saying, I can't leverage my relationships for this organization right now. Right, right. I, you know, if I have people that are closely related to your organization already and not mine, sure, I can I can help with that. But if I'm, I'm not going to be bringing a whole lot of money here. And, and that's a really hard conversation to have, but important to have, yeah. really important to have up front because I do not want to have them thinking that I'm not mm -hmm. fulfilling a responsibility that I should be. It's, that's one of the hardest things. The private conversation or the personal conversation, not necessarily private, but the one-on-one -on -one conversation, I think is an important element we don't think of with boards often because we think of the once a month board meeting. <laughs> And yet I do think that the majority of the business that gets done, the majority of the work that gets done is when an executive director or board or development director has a conversation with every board member about what they can bring to the table, yeah. where they're fulfilled, what they want to be doing. I think that often it's like, I need these things, right? Yeah. My board experience has been a, lit, a laundry list of needs thrown at me. And I'm like, do I just check this box? Like, <laughs> right. you know, but the conversation yeah. then leads to involvement, engagement, relationships, shared goals, objectives that I think a lot of what you've been talking about is that you've had a lot of those side conversations with staff, with leadership about what you can bring to the table. And then that's what gets leveraged. And that's the way that you're able to like fulfill the most in yeah. your board capacity. Yeah. Thank you. I, I learned uh, at one of my development jobs, um, this really awesome sort of meeting rhythm that I mm. tr have tried to use where there was, it was just talked about in the board level that once a year you're going to sit down with the development director and they're going to go through a plan with you. And it's, I, I think I still have the form somewhere in all my Google Drive something, but it was really cool because you went through and said um, what people in advance committed to what they thought they were going to be able to give for the three or four different types of giving opportunities mm -hmm. they would have. And then um, we talked about like their professional interests. What are they trying to learn right now? What do you think is unique that you could mm. bring to the organization? And it often changed from year to year. Yeah. So having that conversation, saying up front, we're going to do it, planning for it, making the appointments and all that, everybody expected it. And I often found that board members would really prepare, like they'd really sit and think like, what do I want to do differently? What do I want to know more about, about this organization? And that then we would sit down and make a plan for the whole year about how are we going to engage this board member differently. And it was transformational because mm. 
most of the time they ended up giving more than they committed. Yeah. Because they felt so connected to the work yeah. and it was it was a really cool thing. So I've tr- that was quite a while ago and I've tried to continue to do that. It works really well on engagement too. And the other thing it does is we as staff members often think the board knows, we forget that the board doesn't know everything we know. Right. Right. We, we are in it all day, yeah. every day. And I often will go to a board member or go to a board meeting and we'll be talking about something and a board member's going, what are you, what, uh-huh. <laughs> what are we doing? And we just sort of by osmosis think they know and right. they don't. So I think those conversations every year also open up an opportunity for them to ask you questions about things that they're not quite clear on right now, yeah. or they've heard us talk about, but they need more clarity and they don't want to ask in a full board meeting. So you have a little bit of that freedom to ask the questions that you might be embarrassed to ask in a group setting. Uh So those conversations are really powerful. I was on a board for three years that the every meeting I was doing that, (laughs) what is happening? I don't understand. (laughs) And I finally, when I left the board, like my term was up and I left the board and I was asked, do I want to like be on the board again? And I was like, I hate to say this, but I don't think I'm smart enough to be on this board. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm so confused by what is happening. And then learned later from other board members that it was a shared board experience Mm. we were having. And it was just that assumption of osmosis. Like, of course, we know what's going on because we're not in the work every day. Right. And the (laughs) other hat I've worn is as a communications person. And uh so one of the things that we do is like, well, we put it on the website. Oh, yeah. like, right. Right. So like we assume that our <laughs> all of our board members are reading our website every day. Right. right? Like, we can't. There's. Yeah. So there's communication strategy that really has to be a part of how you manage a board. too. Uh-huh. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Well, and realizing, too, that your board members, like we're asking people to have an imagination about their donors, your board members have a personal mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. They have passions and whys. And. And at some point, this yes to this board theoretically has intersected with those. Right. Mm-hmm. So how do we cultivate that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and when it's a, a really big cause organization, that the willingness to leverage their relationships and their yeah. resources can be really high. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge ask, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah. something that, that that is a great resource. Let's take a quick break. Okay. We're going to thank some of our amazing partners. And when we come back, we're going to get into the elevator. We've got Lisa Watson. We'll be right back. Loving the fundraising elevator, but wondering how you can talk to Sam and Kristen? Well, now's your chance to do it. Book one-on-one consulting time with Swain Strategies experts, Sam, Kristen, and Mary, and get all your event questions answered. Our team has you covered on strategic planning, fundraising strategy, storytelling, data tools, and registration support. Get the tools and the help you need to make the most impact at your fundraising event. Book at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. Welcome back to the Fundraising Elevator. We're excited to be here with Lisa Watson, board member extraordinaire, but also all things nonprofit. You've sort of worn every hat in the nonprofit sector, so you're you have a unique perspective. And um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about fundraising events. I always feel like the fundraising event is an opportunity not just to invite our donors in, but to also have board members inviting their community in. They're in service. They're giving so much of their time, their energy, their funds, that it becomes an opportunity for creating more community in events. But I'm frequently surprised that organizations aren't engaging their board in their event. So I'm curious from your perspective, because you have attended many events, what do you see your role as a board member in helping to prepare for the event, showing up for the event? What's your sort of best event board member advice? Yeah, I would say um, I want to approach this from perspective of strategy. Okay. So mm-hmm. um, I'm going to put my my staff member hat on first and then on my board member hat. So from the staff member perspective, I think the strategy for an, a really effective fundraiser is to go in with a plan of – who we're trying to cultivate, what board members might be able to help talk well about the organization, give them information, who you sit them with really mm-hmm. matters, right? Um, if if it's a board member who's brought guests in, making sure they have everything they need to tell their story of the organization well, is, uh, you know, make sure they introduce people to the potential donors that you're, um, that this board member brought in. 
So I think the piece that I often see missing, Sam, is the strategy around that, right? Like really thinking through who's coming, who do we want to come first, then who's coming, and then how can we maximize the opportunity when we have all of this love and all of this support in the same space. Right. And a lot of it comes down to the work that you all do in our storytelling pieces and that sort of thing. But there's a, a huge role that the board member can play. So I think for me as a board member, um, I'm looking to um, make sure that the director and the um, development person, if that's the appropriate way, meets the people that they haven't met, mm-hmm. right? And and find some commonality between them, share, you know, know about the potential donor's interests, share that with the staff members. Um, I always try to plant a seed of we're going to follow up with you. Like the staff's going to contact you because they want to take you on a tour or whatever the next step might be. Um, and doing that in that moment so you don't lose that sort of connection to the future. Um, I also think it's our responsibility to do the fiduciary responsibility of loyalty and care for the organization and and be well informed about what's going on so you can mm-hmm. talk about it intelligently when you're in that space because people will expect that of you as a board member you should know the strengths of the organization even be know what some of the challenges are because people yeah. may ask that and knowing how they're being addressed um and finally i think <laughs> I'll, I'll say this when I talk about my favorite event in a minute, but I think it's our responsibility to have a good time and to yeah. show people that this is a joyous night and we're celebrating the accomplishments of the organization and um, make sure that they leave with a really positive, good, fun feeling about the organization through the joy they found while, while they were there. It's interesting because the number of events that we do where boards play different roles, the strongest events are always the ones where the boards see themselves as a part of the organization, as host Mm -hmm. to the event, welcoming guests, speaking to strengths, weaknesses, direction of the organization, sharing their own why, and then making sure that people feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, we all have introvert, extrovert qualities and board members that feel more comfortable less comfortable, but sometimes it's nice to actually have a job of not just attending the party, but also attending with the purpose of being an ambassador for the organization. I think it kind of unlocks some of the, I hate parties or I don't feel comfortable in a party setting. It's like, well, here's the role that we need you to play is to welcome folks. And I mean, we've had organizations go as far as the like Devil Wears Prada lookbook. You know, if you remember (laughs) that movie that, you know, the lookbook is created for her so that as she moves through the room, she knows who people are. We've had board members assigned like these five people. Here's what you need to know about them. And when you see them, use their name, welcome them. So I think that that sort of, you spoke very intuitively about it, but that sort of role of this is my organization. I am a part of this organization. Let me bring you in and help you feel connected and feel inspired and feel passionate about this organization is something you do so beautifully. Like it's so intuitive to you because you carry yourself with uh, such caring about the organization. And it just, you know, anytime I've been your guest at a fundraising event, I'm like, I'm in <laughs> whatever she's doing. It's so, Here's my checkbook. <laughs> it's so clearly your heart and your passion mm, and your yeah. connection. And you share that with us so generously and it impacts how we give. So thank you, thank you for always leading thank that you. way. Yeah. Well, At the fundraising elevator, we like to ask every guest the question of um, their favorite event and the tools that they think they need in their tool chest. So step into the elevator for a moment. We're going to head up to the penthouse where the party is. Can you tell us about your favorite event, an event you went to that was memorable and what made it special? Well, it's a little self-serving, but I'm going to use one of the events that I planned because uh-huh. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. so fun. Um, so if we, I worked for an organization that really loved a theme, like more than most. And really, one, really loved one, a theme. Really, really loved a theme. And one year we did um, sort of a Greece-inspired 50s theme, and it was one of the most fun evenings. And part of it was... I mean, I will. I will say we had a budget, not a huge budget, but a good budget yeah. for because because we the organization has a reputation of throwing a really good party, and so the decor was incredible. Like we had this 
um, card, literally made of cardboard or like corrugated plastic, like soda shop that uh-huh. we put together. <laughs> um, the the wine wall was a part of that. I mean, it was just the whole color scheme, the lighting, everything was so vibrant and bright and fun. And from the moment you walked in, you were transported to the 50s, like everything mm-hmm. about it, the photo booth, everything. People love to dress up in this group, oh, so the, the costumes. costumes were amazing. <laughs> they were so the many wigs. pink ladies, <laughs> so many pink ladies, and so many Thunderbirds and um, Danny and Sandy. Uh, but it it just there's something about that that like sort of brings people's shoulders down, right? It's yeah. just fun, and they're just going to relax and have a good time. And there was opportunities to engage everywhere you looked. Like it was, there was a game to play or a thing to participate in or something to try or do. And there were people who were really engaged in that. Others weren't, which was fine. There was space for people who just wanted to socialize. But I think it, what I liked about it is it gave even like potential donors or people without really high capacity to give something to do and to have fun and have a great experience while they were there. Um, And then I love a good dance party. Uh Mm -hmm. It always has a really good dance party. And um, that, I think, it is actually an important part to me because people leave on a high. They come out of that like, that was so fun. And there's a connection between that and people's future potential to be a supporter. So I... I think just I alluded earlier to like a board member's responsibility is to also have a great time and show your guests a great time. I think there's a real connection between that and the effectiveness from a fundraising standpoint. Well, I'll tell you, we were guests at that event. And (laughs) um, we also may have been a little involved in the planning. Our team was involved in the planning of that event. But it was like surprise and delight at every corner. And I think we like undervalue surprise and delight sometimes. And that is what sort of stuck with me is that it was all of the little sort of thought that went into it, but still everything centered on mission. Like even though we were in theme and in costume – Everything tied back to mission. Even, you know, it wasn't just called like Grace the Gala. Like even the name tied back to the work we're doing. The fact that it was sort of a sense of reunion, community, yeah. family mm-hmm. coming together. And um, people were really like celebrated for showing up, yeah. which I think is really important, especially mm-hmm. right now. Like people just want to be in community. And we're in this like environment where it's like we're creating divides and it's your fault. And this sense of like connecting over something that's a shared value is just so powerful. And so it was really fun to be a guest at yeah. that event. Yeah. Thanks so for having yeah. us. Well, thank you for all of your help. And I think – to you know, to um, talk a little bit about your work, the storytelling work that that at the events that you all do, and especially the ones I've been involved in, have been so um, so clear and uh, and mission oriented, but in a way that just makes you feel like you can't not love mm-hmm. what the work of this organization is. Like it just you bring people in in such a good. Um, healthy and fun and touching way. So that was a huge part, a huge part of the success of that event and all the events that we've had with you. So thank you. Thank you. Well, so let's hop back in the elevator, head down to the boiler room and check out where the tools are. What tool do you think that board members should have in their toolkit? Like what is the thing that you think they should bring with them prepared for? (laughs) Self-awareness. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> I think you have to be very aware of your capacity, uh-huh. of your your why, your interest in the organization, like why, really knowing why you're thinking about working with this organization. Because you alluded earlier to sometimes people do this for a resume builder or just to have it on their, you know, their LinkedIn or whatever. I think being really self-aware about your your why of, mm-hmm. because you're going to make decisions about how you spend your time. And if this isn't something you care deeply about, you're probably not going to make decisions that are always in the best interest of the organization. Right. So being really in tune with why you want to support this organization, I think, really matters. Um, and then being honest with yourself and honest with the organization. If it's a yes or a no, um, really being honest about that. Um, I've been in so many situations where I could clearly see a board member should have said no mm-hmm. for capacity reasons, lack of passion about the organization, um, not just not interested. And 
did it maybe because their corporation was telling them to, but also maybe because they thought, oh, this will, you know, this looks fun or right. And if you get in there and it's not what you thought it was, it serves the organization Mm -hmm. for you to leave. And I just, I think that just keeping that self-awareness the whole time you're engaged with an organization is really important. You know, I've had capacity come and go and I've just been really honest with the organization and said, I got to back away for a little bit. I want you to know this isn't long term. It's not intentional. I got some stuff happening. You might not see me as much for the next couple of months, but just know that I still love the work and I'm I'm in. I just need to pull away a little bit. Just being honest about that and being really self-aware is is really important. We want to put our best foot forward and oftentimes we just can't. And mm-hmm. knowing when that's happening is so important and it will be such a relief to the organization yeah. if you just say it. Yeah. Just be honest about it. I think it also models how the organization could be within their own work culture and their own sort of awareness of when people need to step back, when people need to say yes and no. So I think as a board member, your own self-awareness can help create a positive culture for a a sector that has not always had the best work culture. Yeah, yeah. I know because we're – I totally agree with you. And I think being human-centered and how you approach that and just saying, oh, gosh. you know, And and if a board member comes to you and says that, your only job is to say, okay, let us know if we can support you. And let them go for a while. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I just, I we I think it's, I'm happy to see that there's a lot more organizations, I think, leaning into being a little more human-centered yeah. and yeah. acknowledging we're human beings that are going to have challenges and times that we can't engage fully and workplaces that are doing that more too. So I think the flexibility of all of that is important to acknowledge and honor. Well, and the idea that honesty maybe could bring us together versus yeah. being this bomb we're going to detonate that I don't know how anybody's going to recover. Like it, it it ramps up that way, whereas yeah. in fact, the honesty could be, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. That's yeah. probably going to be your answer. Maybe right? it's simple and elegant, right? Yes. Maybe it's all just simple and yeah. elegant. Yeah, and we build it up into this, oh my gosh, this is going to be so hard. Yeah. It's not. It's just not. It'll be fine. The organization will be fine. You will be fine. True. (laughs) I think that's true. Everybody's going to be fine, y'all. It's all going to be fine. Everybody's going to be fine. (laughs) If you would love to spend more time with Lisa Watson and (laughs) us, you should join all of us at Elevate, our fundraising conference. You can join online, in person. In Portland, Oregon, it'll be in person. It's February 1st and 2nd. 2024. 2024. We will all be together. Lisa is going to come and so be, excited. be our um, ringleader, <laughs> MC, host. host, most importantly, and we're so, so honored to have her. But more than that, um, I'm just honored to know you. I'm honored for all you champion in the sector, for all the work that you do. Um, Let's all remember our board members are volunteers. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And ideally, um, they're there because they have a why that your mission intersects with, and they want to move this work forward. So we're so grateful for all the work that you do. Thank you. What a pleasure it was to spend time with you today. Thanks for joining us. The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV department. The program is produced by April Clark and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson and Heidi Christensen. Video production by Chris Peterson, Whitney Gomes, and Nathan Bouquet. Video editing by Steve Osborne. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group. And support from Sophia Keller, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett. The Fundraising Elevator is recorded at the AV Department in Portland, Oregon. For years, they've been our trusted partner, delivering exceptional audiovisual production and videography for nonprofits. In 2020, they transformed into a dynamic live streaming studio, producing more than 900 virtual and hybrid events. Now, we embark on an exciting journey together to bring you this podcast. Seeking the best in live events, video production, and live streaming? We proudly recommend our friends at the AV department. Link in the episode description.